Hey everybody, welcome to the show. YouTubers, leave us a comment in the chat and smash the like and subscribe button as we review the match that just ended at the San Siro, plus much, much more. Let's have it. Hey everybody, I'm Ian Joy, alongside Nigel Rio Coker, Michael LaHood and James Bench. Really excited to get into it today as we take a closer look at Italy against England. Plus we take a look at what else happened around the international fixture list today and a little bit of yesterday and we'll preview what's coming up. So Kegelazzo begins right now. Hey everybody. What's up with you, English fans out there? Hey, what's up with you, Nigel Rio Coker? What's up with you, James Bench? Yeah? I got a smile from Michael Hood when I said that there. Yeah, England and Italy just finished right now at the San Siro. Italy running out by a goal to nil winners. Um, Nigel Rio Coker, James Bench, the group chat was on fire today. First and foremost, I guess I've got to get your opinion on the game overall before we get into the, the deep, dark secrets as to what the media might say and who was the star performer and not. Overall, Thoughts on the game? Let's start with you, Nigel. No, let's start with James. Go on, James. Oh, I don't <laughs> want to talk about this. I can't believe I, I never thought of all the things I thought I might have to talk about in my life. Hmm. England getting relegated was not high on that list. And, yes! Uh, <laughs> I believe we have to, might have to play Scotland next time. The humiliation, Kazakhstan, hmm. Georgia. It is <laughs> demeaning. And it's only 14 months ago that England were within hmm. touching distance of being kings of Europe. And now we've been cast out from the Royal Court to play around with the, the lesser teams like Scotland. Um, <laughs> it's, it's demeaning. It, it was embarrassing. Uh, and I thought the performance was kind of reflective of, of where England have gone wrong since Euro 2020. I think Gareth Southgate has earned the right to do whatever he wants. And he certainly earned the right to take this team to the World Cup because he has got results for England on the international stage. But right now, I don't think he knows what he's trying to do. This seemed like a team caught between two pillars, a team that partly, you know, he's trying to shoehorn in these excellent attacking players. He's trying to find a way of getting Saka and Foden and Sterling in one team. But then it produces such ugly football. It's so cautious with all these talented players, you know, still can't score a goal from open play, could hardly get a top shot on target. I mean, on the bright side, at least we now have a... a uh, a figurehead, a player on whom we can, whose metatarsals we can closely examine over the coming months and be terrified if anything happens to Jude Bellingham. So, uh, yeah, there's that. <laughs> I got That's all James else. has to say. Okay, thanks, James. No, um, I'm with James. I think it's, it's, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on, as we know. World Cup in 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 Christmas is the first ever one. But you've got to look at this right now. For every nation participating in these games, it's the last kind of preparations for the World Cup. I think there's more pressure in the media on Gareth Southgate than there is on the players. Because James and I are very aware of the English press. They can be brutal and ruthless. And if the players weren't good enough, they will be hanging some of these players out to dry. And I think for me, the players are good enough. I just feel that, like James kind of puts uh, alludes to, that they're playing within themselves. I think that he's trying to put too much spice in that stew to make it work. And it's tasting real bitter right now. I think that he needs to stick with what he believes is the best attacking force. And then maybe to a certain degree, you can even criticize him, James. I think maybe he's being too loyal to certain players because there's yeah. other players in the fringes mm -hmm. who are on form, who are playing fantastic. Yeah, who are well. playing regular football, Nigel. As regular well. Regular yeah, football yeah, who deserve yeah. to be in the team. And that's the problem with England sometimes. It, be, it gets this gang life mentality once you're in. It's harder mm -hmm. to get out than it is to get in. And, and that's what I think that can be also something that people could question. The fact of maybe Jack Grealish should start. Maybe he can be the catalyst or something different that England need. Because in the attacking sense, we look stale and dry. And my mm -hmm. tactical analysis of what I saw, which I still don't understand. I love Raheem Sterling. I don't want Raheem Sterling coming to the ball all the time. He's no longer at Manchester City when he's playing for England. You don't have those players around you where it's the pep system. You know where your next pass is instantly. You're all playing at different clubs. Raheem Sterling played to his strengths. Stay high up the pitch. Stay high. Try and isolate him in one-on-one -on -one situations. Let him use his pace to be a willing runner to go in behind. You Which don't England see did really well. Pardon? England used to do that really well. They like used to do it well, but they don't. Was... No. But you look at Italy's goal from Rapasadi. Runs in behind. Fantastic touch. Comes back inside. Carl Walker gives him way too much time on the ball. That I'm sure Carl Walker knows that that's not good enough for the quality player that he is. But at that international level, that's what happens. You get punished. But my main point is, Italy 
grinded out the, the result. They fought, they battled. They brought back, let's just say, historic memories of the great Franco Baresi. If anyone who doesn't know who Franco Baresi is, Google him on YouTube. One of the best man markers this world and football has ever seen. They got tight on Saka. They got tight on Sterling. They did the dirty arts. They gave a bit of a gladiator performance from the Italians, but they also mixed it up and went long. They weren't scared to go long. You didn't have to play beautiful football all the way through. How many times did England go long and put Sterling high up? Instead, they're trying to play in through the middle for Sterling and they're getting absolutely smothered and losing the ball. Overall, it wasn't a dreadful performance. I'll probably say it's a bit worrying. And my only worrying aspect of it is confidence. Because when that goal went in, all England heads dropped. The confidence in that dressing room is very low right now. And Gareth Southgate needs to find a way to get that confidence back up in that England dressing room. Whether he tells the boys, go out for a night out, get drunk, do whatever, just to get your footballing ability back. Very it works. It, it you used to work back in the day. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Or get the boys to hang out with Neymar somewhere, whatever Neymar's oh, been doing in this geez. off season. A, a to trip to Asia back. in the dentist no, chair. Is that what you're I'm asking for? Hey, let, let, <laughs> no, it, no, it, I'm, I'm going to jump in. Over the game. I'm so, jumping I, in I here. mean, it, it's not worrying. I don't know what James thinks or Ian or, you know, Michael. Well, Michael doesn't yeah. really matter because he just... <laughs> what saying, so. I'm going to tell you exactly. Think, but I'm going to tell you exactly what I think. The talent is there. It's just not a good enough performance for what England standards that they've set and the confidence is low. Go on, Mike. The floor yeah, go ahead, Mike. For, first of all, anyone if anyone finds who the hell this Rapasati guy is, you tell him hello because that's not even his name. It's Raspadori. Put some respect to this man's name. Put England to the cleaners with the goal. You say Rapasati. That sounds like a pasta, uh, man. I was Put close. some respect to this guy's I'm name. I'm right now. I'm emotional. He plays for Napoli. You should know. We've been hyping up Napoli. This guy's yes. had a golden start to the season. I'm and emotional, he's a player, Mike. Find you, he's a player that is a midfielder that played as a second striker today. England is getting exposed by players not even playing in their natural position. As a team that's slated to be the favorite in this group, I don't understand how you cannot be in panic stations. You, 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 you're you winless in your last five. They have the best squad in the group by a mile? Don't matter. Last time, England, played the United, last time England had the best group, or best squad by a mile, 2010. I want to take you back they there. Did. What'd that's you do? The they didn't. You didn't think that you, you think okay, that Michael, group, you didn't my, think my thing is this. Squad. Okay, okay. If you look at the current squad now, they've got tournament experience. Let's not compare to America's tournament experience when it comes to the World Cup now. Okay, let's not treat this like it's the World Keep it Cup. On England. Because it's, I'm keeping it on England. All right, all right, Ian. Sorry, you know, the affiliation of USA. My bad. I, I'm just enjoying watching <laughs> you. Anyway, I'm, enjoying I'm watching just you. saying, no, I agree. No, I understand what Mike's saying, but Mike, there is tournament experience of a World Cup. A majority of that England squad hasn't changed. There's a big difference when you talk about what you're going to get in the World Cup compared to what America are going to bring. Like I said, this is difficult times right now because the reality of it is with all these results, all these clubs and these all these nations are focusing on the World Cup. That's something I think we all have to agree on. Everyone is focused on the World Cup. Results might not go the right way, but the main focus is the World Cup because this is the last bit of preparation all these managers get. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got comment coming in there. Oh, hold on a minute. Go on, James. Yeah, Let me yeah. just read this comment here. Maguire yeah. is not a first team player at club level, but you Thank put him you. in a competitive game like this, shaking his head is Aidan Kudonu. And um, listen, Kudonu. I think that's to all of your points. You're basically at the same situation. You He's all agree. Right. He's 100 They right. need to be playing. I mean, and the commentator today, uh, especially here in the States, James, I don't know if you had the same commentator over in, in the UK, but the commentator said today that it's almost as if Gareth Southgate's going off from what he said he was setting out to do, making sure that players who are going to be in a starting 11 were playing regular football, were in form, and were ready to represent with a passion the nation. And it's almost as if they, he's taken a step back from that. Now, I get it. I understand it's the Nation League and there's something to play for here. But let's not forget that it's so close to the World Cup that I'm sure in the back of the minds of some of these players, they don't want to get injured. There's a lot of games going on right now. Um, but still, this was an international game that you would expect England to have been a, a lot better than they were think, today. But, but I think we take Harry Maguire and kind of blow that up across the whole squad. Harry Maguire d doesn't merit playing, although it has to be said, he has been outstanding for England at tournament football. Like, well, why does he, he not deserve to the... play then, James? Why does he exactly. not deserve yeah. to play? Because he's not getting in the one. Because he's not getting in the team two. Because you have Fakaya Tamori and Mark Gay. You, I both. Tamori should have started. Yeah, Tamori. 
left left side of that back tree. Everyone else, though, in that team has played well enough this season that they yeah. merit Decl- playing. I Declan mean, Rice maybe... merits to start for England. Declan yeah, Rice, part of the bot. Oh. Declan Rice is uh, Declan Rice has been fine this season. He's not been. Oh, as he's good forgot. As he's been, forgot. He's forgot. I, don't he's, I, don't he's, I don't think he's been fine this season. He has been. I don't think he's been fine. But then again, if you don't play Dec, if you don't play Declan Rice, who else are you going to play in there? That's the problem. Right, Who else you got? You have to play to your strengths, and that's the reality of England. You have to play for your strengths. He isn't having a great time at West Ham, but still for England, he does okay. But again, when you look at that team there, they're playing within themselves. Jude Bellingham is the only one who made forward passes, had the enthusiasm to get forward, wasn't scared at all, because that's the same style he plays at Borussia Dortmund. The England players are playing within themselves, and Jude Bellingham is not dealing with the English press and everything that comes with it, because the English press don't help themselves. And I'm the Mm -hmm. first to admit that. And so would James and other English players who played at that international level. The press do not help themselves. We look at Italy now, how Italy competed against England. I didn't see that same energy and enthusiasm in their last game to qualify for a World Cup. And it goes to a conversation we had in the previous pod about how when you play against certain nations, they raise the bar and they raise their level. Mm -hmm. That's what comes with it. And I feel with England, it just needs to be some kind of reignition or restart or a light or a catalyst to get yeah. these guys competing at a higher level because you have to play to the strengths, Mike, that you have. Let, let me just rattle out a few statistics for you yeah. here and I hope I've got these uh, correct, Mike, before you go. I mean, Gareth Southgate, you talk about the pressure there, Nigel, and anybody who's out there watching in, we're obviously talking about Italy's um, glorious victory over England today in the Nations League and uh, Gareth Southgate now being the man under pressure and according to our Nigel, he's going to feel more heat than the players will do. So let's ra- read off a few statistics right now. Mm. Um, James, you touched upon it a moment ago. I think it's no wins in the last five international games mm-hmm. now for England, yeah. one goal scored in the last five international games and seven goals uh, conceded in the last five international games, if I'm not mistaken. So something tells me that it's not just Gareth Southgate, unless you guys can convince me otherwise. I mean, Mike, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm concerned about these players. When you when you look at the number of players that are stepping out on the field for England and you do have players, you talked about Tamori, Tammy Abraham. If you're going to use this game to give the likes of a Harry Maguire an opportunity to, to regain form, you're going to trust. Why not give a Tammy Abraham a, a game? He's won something from last season. Yes, you know Harry Kane's going to be your out-and-out striker, but why not test? Why not put some of these players who are comfortable because the manager's taken a lot of the heat off of them in the press? Raheem Sterling, put a little bit of fire under his feet. Mason Mount's on the bench. Put Mason Mount in next game to see if he's up to snuff. It's not about what you did last season. It's about how good you are now. What you did a year ago in the Euros does not matter. Not a single team going to the FIFA World Cup is going to be looking at England saying, oh, man, they've lost five or they haven't won one in the last five. But, you know, they did get to the Euro finals. Let's be scared of England. It's going to be put them on the game list next game because we're going to smash them. Hungary humiliated them across two games and now another humiliating loss. And yes, it was only one nil. But to lose to an Italian team that has come out of a really crappy crap. I mean, this is an Italy team that was in crisis only a couple months ago. And you're having a player who's not even an out and out striker coming on and scoring a world class goal. You have Samaka, who hasn't even played minutes this season for your very own West Ham, making a case. He had a golden opportunity to score early on in this game. You have Italian players who are saying and Benucci. We've talked about him and what a sorry performance he's been putting in. Lovely assist, though. For Juventus, class assist. Other teams are playing with a bit between their teeth because now they're under pressure. England, these players need to be put under pressure. Yes, the manager's getting it wrong. But Kyle Saka playing at left wing back. Benj, I know you know him week in, week out. That's, that's a farce. The kid is killing it in the Premier League, playing on the right side. Put him on the right side. Stop making stuff as you go. But the players that are being put in their positions to, to succeed need to be held accountable. And if they're not, find the next guy. There's champions in this group. Play them. They're in form. Play them. They're getting games week in and week out, Champions League level. Harry Maguire, if I see him on the starting lineup of any other game going to this World Cup, that's on I mean, that's on Southgate. But also, who's, who's going to step up in that locker room? I think there's too many nice guys in this England team. I don't. I don't see anyone who has the 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 bottle to step up and go up to Southgate and say, "Hey, I think they can, though, Mike. I think they can, though, Mike." Yeah, I have to say, Mike. I think you've kind of made a point in defence of England there, but by bringing in Italy, because as you say, I mean, they were in crisis a few months ago, but then a few months before that, they were the European champions, and you know, the future of of world football lay at, at Italy's feet, and with Roberto Mancini. 
you know, these things wax and wane, even even for great teams like Italy, who will not be at the World Cup. I, I, I think to an extent, we're kind of catastrophizing over one bad result and a weird, weird set of four games in the Nations League, which, you know, I think is a, has been a great addition to the European calendar, but it's not that big a deal. You know, we have, we have turned this into a, a great crisis for England. And yes, it's a bit funny and embarrassing that they got relegated. But ultimately, this is a team that has kind of played the same quite attritional football that maybe doesn't make the most out of all of its attacking superstars at the World Cup in 2018 and then the Euros three years later. And in doing so, they reached the semi-finals and the final. You know, it is it is quite clear that Gareth Southgate is a successful manager. And, you know, the, 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 it is natural and we all do it. And I have written my pieces not exactly glowing about him. But it is not a catastrophe. This is, and may, and it will be if, if things don't go right in the World Cup. And it will be a real shame because this is a uniquely talented generation. I mean, let's take the Saka case. It's not a dreadful idea at all, I don't think. You are trying to get in as many talented footballers as you can. I mean, the, the problem is it's not an idea that England have worked on. Maybe they'll be able to do that before Qatar. But, you know, if you're saying to me, let's get Saka and Sterling on the same flank with a better version of Maguire building possession, which is something he's fantastic at. You know, that that's all good. These are all good ideas. They're reasonable ideas. And yeah, it's going wrong right now. But it isn't that big a deal. And it's not like, you know, as Nigel and I keep saying, it's not like you can't turn this around with the players you have at your disposal and a manager that knows what he's doing in tournament football. I mean, for me, like, all I want to add to that is what I've said before. I think that um, Michael made some great points, but this is it, Mike. The reality mm. of it is, like we said, all the pressure from the press and the media is going to be on Gareth Southgate because he put himself in this position. He's got more questions than answers. Like you said, the Saka is a great one. The press are going to be all over that. Why are you playing him out of position? His performance isn't down to him. It's the manager's responsibility for playing him out of position. You had your vision. It didn't kind of work out. Then he's going to have to defend players who are not playing at their club, getting into the England team and playing. You know, you bring Luke Shaw on. When was the last time he played for Manchester United? So these are all things that I'm saying why the manager is going to be under pressure. The English mm. press, if the players weren't good enough, trust me, the players would get it in the press. They are mm. unforgiving and they will destroy players' careers if you don't represent England well enough or they don't think you're good enough. So that is why I think that Gareth Southgate has put himself in this position. And again, it for me, I think the players need to take more responsibility because from that performance... I didn't see an aggressive England. I didn't see an England that really believed in themselves. I saw an England that were playing inhibited, playing within themselves, not being aggressive, not making enough runs in behind, willing runners to get in behind and to score a goal and create things. And maybe it's got a bit stale. Maybe mm -hmm. the Matt Gareth Southgate can change that by putting in other players and shaking up the team. Like you said, Tammy Abraham's been on fantastic form. He deserves to start. What's the point of calling him to the squad if you're not going to use him? We already know what Harry Kane can do, what he's capable of. The rest maybe might even be beneficial for Harry Kane for the long term for the World Cup. So you're 100% right. But this is why I say that it's more so 50% on the manager who has to answer questions on decisions that he made. And I would say 50% players need to take responsibility because I didn't see a hungry England players. I didn't see an aggressive English team. and I didn't see players that really believed in themselves. It's been a long time since England have beaten Italy, if I'm not mistaken. It's all the way back in 2012. And yet again, they lost today against Italy in the San Siro. Raspadori with the winning goal. 22-year-old has been in great form. Three goals in his last four games for club and country. That's also his fourth national team goal. You're watching Kei Golazzo. It's Ian Joy with Nigel Rio Coker, James Benj, and Michael LaHood. Um, just before we move on, we have to help out our Italian fans who are tuning in. Uh, we also saw a comment coming in saying... It's not been uh, the best of runs uh, for England against Italy. Yet again, they are defeated by the Italians. But quick thought on the Italians' performance. I thought they defended very well. Uh, James, I'll start with you about the Italians. And then, Nigel, I want to know from you what you thought about Scamacca's performance up top there. Mm. Only two shots from him in the game. Go ahead, James. Yeah, I mean, Raspadori was excellent. I thought Barella had a really nice game and, and Di Marco as well. I think with them... They're just in a system that they all know really well. And it, it, it clicked back into a groove. Obviously, something got out of place for them in World Cup qualifying, which was pretty competitive and some slightly freakish results there. But um, yeah, I really, really loved Raspadori. And it's it's funny to think he's kind of not even the star guy in this this Napoli team at the moment. Um, yeah, 
I'm, I, I'll be honest, just because they're not at the World Cup, I kind of wasn't paying much attention to them. No, it's, but, it's, it's um, fine. Mm. Yeah, I'm sure we will be seeing a lot of Sugamaka as well. I just think for me, Italy reminded me of the Italy of old. I think that was the yeah. old school Italy, Italian way, very aggressive, uh, kind of gladiator-like performance where they all won their individual one-on-one -on -one battles. You know, they weren't intimidated by whoever they were coming up against. They were getting tight on Sterling, not letting him turn, getting tight on Saka because they know how dangerous he can be. Very aggressive with their defensive uh, duties, but also... Like James said, they seem to play a system that all the players know exactly what's expected for them. And if you look at some of the passes that were made from centre-backs into that midfield area, it wasn't easy passes. It was passes with confidence mm. and belief in one another. Some great balls into that midfield area where it was just dropped off for the next one to go forward. And what I like about Italy is they play the beautiful game. If they need to do the dark arts, they do the dark arts. And if they need to go direct, they go direct. They don't mm -hmm. try and play from back to front like we know some teams would always continuously try to do. Italy mm -hmm. mix up the game and they play to whatever their opponent they're to coming up against is to get yeah. a result. And mm -hmm. the goal for me just is just a standout from the pass, the touch, the control and the finish. Fantastic. You can't tell me England don't have players with tremendous amount of pace to get in behind and England can't be direct like that. But the difference is Italy had the belief and confidence to do it and England for me just didn't do it. Well, thanks to everybody out there for your comments. Please keep your comments. If you want to have your say on the show, just drop them and we'll put the best ones up as potentially as best we can. Um, we did see one from Matt Osman saying Italy are better um, without Immobile, which is crazy because he does so well for Lazio. Uh, yeah. Interesting to see. Another one from Rocco. He said Benucci looked vintage again today. He's been terrible for Juventus, but he was pretty good today and also got the assist on the goal. And Serge also said that Italy won four World Cups. Italy in big games, they always show up. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case through World Cup qualifying for you Italian fans out there. But we thank you all for tuning in regardless. Let's move to some of the other international games that were taking place in the Nation League today. We'll start with uh, Germany against Hungary. Uh, Des, producer Des, if you could throw up the table, this is a very good show. And once again, from a Hungary side who got the only goal in the game, thanks to Adam Zalai, the 34-year-old now. Believe it or not, 34-year-old, mm -hmm. almost as old as me. And um, yeah, 20 <laughs> years younger than Nigel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he scored against Germany at the Euros. He's yeah. uh, now scored his 26th national team goal. Uh, beautiful victory. I was watching this game, and I know you guys were kind of coming back and forth between uh, the Italy-England game, but also the Germany-Hungary game. But this is a massive statement victory from Hungary, but also quite worrying for Germany. Mike, let's start with you. I mean, surprise result here, but we have to say well done to Hungary. They topped the group. I love this Hungarian team, and there's a lot of spillover effect from the group that got the result against Germany. You have so many players who are familiar with the German league, a lot of Bundesliga players. I look at, was it Salai has Bundesliga experience. He plays for Basel now, but a proven goal scorer in big tournaments and big games. But look throughout this team. You have Sobot Salai, who plays for Leipzig. You have with Gulachi, the goalkeeper, proven winner, German Cup winner with Leipzig. Down the spine of the team, this is a team that's committed to defending. Schaefer plays for the league-leading Union Berlin. You have so many players who were young at the last Euros and are now coming into their own, coming into a system that fits them, where you defend, everyone defends. What was remarkable was Gulachi played outstanding. And for this Hungarian What's team... Good? For this Hungarian team to be successful, their back line and their back three and their goalkeeper do have to come up with big moments, which then set up a golden opportunity for their front three. And they've been playing for the last four years, playing this three, four, almost like Christmas tree formation, three, four, two attacking midfielders and a target striker. And that interchangeability between the three, you know, your target striker is always going to be central and the German team. With a, with a back four, they looked all over the place. In the last couple tournaments, you've seen them shift to a back three, and you could see the look of frustration on Hansi Flick's face at the end of the final whistle. It wasn't for a lack of chances that this game didn't deliver. It was just an outstanding Hungarian performance. And Hungary is a team that's in form. They did the business against England, not once, but twice. And now they're doing the business against Germany, top of the group. I know it's the Nations League. And the big, the big countries, the big country press people, James Benz, I'm calling you out. It's easy to say, ah, it's the Nation League. Hungary, these are the things that are setting, setting it up for the next Euros and who knows, the next World Cup to be. Can I just add, before you <sighs> jump in, James, <laughs> let me just add here that that was the first <laughs> defeat 
for Hansi Flick as the manager of Germany. First ever defeat, which is a crazy statistic right there. But I, I, I love the points you make about Hungary and how dangerous they are. I mean, they had, what, three Leipzig players playing in Leipzig for Hungary and uh, defeating Germany. It must be a great feeling for them. But James Bench, I mean, worrying for Germany offensively. I'm not worried about them too much defensively. I'm worried about what they're doing offensively. Struggling to score goals. Timo Werner again. I mean, just, they look a little bit lost sometimes, Germany. Yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously you will have seen more more of this game than me, and but my understanding is that he played Werner kind of up front on his own with yes. with the three in behind, and I mean, you know, you don't have to have watched much football in Leipzig to know that that's not how you get the best out of Timo Werner, and that he needs someone near him. I mean, you know, Thomas Tuchel, Frank Lampard, why no one has really, and and now Hansi Flick, why no one has really tried Havertz and Werner as a true front two. I don't really know. And, and you know, I, I think across that squad, it, it worries me that there isn't that obvious answer. I like Havertz as a as a centre forward, but you have to get the players around him spot on. I think you can with the options Flick has. Um, and then, you know, if you're playing Werner, you need to play two up top. Um, mm -hmm. These are things you shouldn't be having to work out on the fly late on, you know, kind of similar to the issues that England have. Um, mm -hmm. And it would, it would worry me. But equally, I... I don't see an, an obvious solution for Flick that doesn't involve, like, you know, ripping up the rule book, ripping up the approach with with one game to go. I think sometimes life football just hands you a, a, a dud hand, and you know we can kind of trace this right back as as I think it's Rafa Honigstein in his book on on when Germany won the World Cup. Did you know the greatness that they built in this cadre of attacking midfielders that even succeeded that team from 2014? It doesn't mean they've created a lot of players that are very similar. You've got a generation of Sanes, Gnabrys, uh, Havertz's, Werners, wide forwards, and absolutely no one to play through the middle at all. It's um, it's a bit of a headache, and I'm not the one that can fix that. Mm -hmm. Nigel, you got anything to add? I don't want to talk about the Germans. I'm going to join Mike's bandwagon <laughs> on Hungary. Hungary were absolutely fantastic. And like Mike said, they beat England and they beat Germany. They're making a massive statement. And Mike said everything pretty much. They're so well organized, so resilient, so difficult to beat. It's a team effort with Hungary, a real team effort. And the only thing that Mike forgot to say is the government is what needs to be getting a bit of credit for Hungary's situation right now. They heavily invested in the footballing structure in Hungary to put them where they are right now. I, hope, I believe that the, the, the president is a big football fan. And he put so much money to reinvest into the footballing system or structure of Hungary. And now they're reaping the rewards. They really are making statement wins in Europe and becoming a dominant force in European football. You know, I don't want to talk about Germany and, you know, what they did, the problems and that. They've got the players. They need to find out and put the puzzle together. That's something that they can work out and do. But you've got to give credit to teams like Hungary because for me, again, they've got experience across Europe. Not a tremendous amount, but for what they're doing, just getting the players to play with such commitment, desire and work rate and effort to get that win, we've got to give them a tremendous amount of credit. Yeah, they sort of done a Germany Hungary. What they've done is they've invested in youth, and these young players are now reaching uh, a point where they are transferring over to really big European clubs, top five domestic leagues, and they're playing competitive competitively week in and week out. And you're starting to see the national team benefit from that. I thought it was tremendous to see that performance. The way they were counterattacking against Germany mm -hmm. today was fantastic. Every single time Germany broke down around the top of the box. Hungary were gone. They were dangerous. They were creating. Just couldn't find that finishing touch until eventually he got that goal, obviously, off a set play, which was a great finish from Adam Zalai. But to touch upon Germany real quickly, obviously, it's interesting to see them lose a game, but I just don't see that, that killer. I don't see that punch. Mm -hmm. I am impressed with what they've got in, as a roster in general. They have tremendously talented players, similar to England in many ways. I would say this. Maybe you both disagree with me. But there are question marks about Germany, as I have question marks about England. You can recognize that they have the potential to go so far in a World Cup, could yeah. potentially make a final, but it could go horribly wrong and it could end up in disaster. So I think Germany's pretty much in the same boat as an England are when it comes to the World Cup. But I am uh, very impressed with what Hungary did uh, in that game. Very impressed with what they've done throughout the Nations League as well. Go ahead, James. Yeah, I just wanted to dive in as you're talking about how uh, how doomed you think Germany and England are. Uh, I hate to say it, but uh, the, uh, my desk tasked me with uh, predicting the World Cup 
that, and this ran just before this evening's Nations League games. I might have had Germany beating England on penalties in the semis. Oh, wow. from your lips to Gareth South Bay, Southgate's tactic board. <laughs> I think you yeah, take something's the best. You just keep to yourself. Then. <laughs> Would he take that right now? Let me ask you that, James. Would he take that right now? Would Gareth Southgate take a semi-final appearance and a oh. defeat to Germany in the penalty kicks? Would he take that? No. No, he wouldn't. Hansi no, Flick easy, definitely straight. would. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Even, uh, yeah, exactly. He said Hansi, anyone wouldn't Hansi take Hansi Flick it. would. What, be, get into the World Cup final? Yeah. Oh, get them, I, have I think them, losing, I have them okay, losing I to Argentina. Totally right. uh, I have yeah, them losing that's a good, to yeah. Argentina in the World Cup final. Wow, well, very, very good, guys. Excellent stuff, as always. I mean, we just went through what happened at the San Siro. Italy running out 1-0 victory over England, thanks to the goal from Raspadori. We just broke down Hungary's victory over Germany, thanks to Adam Zalai's lone goal in the 17th minute. Um, really excellent stuff from you guys as well. Some terrific points to look forward to coming after the break as well. We're going to look at some of the other Nations League games, but also take a look at what else has been happening around the international stage. I can't wait to hear what the guys have got to say about Brazil's outstanding performance and Michael LaHood. We're going to talk about Team USA next. Stay with us. The UEFA Champions League. Nine months of heart stopping, hold your breath, acceleration. While Mbappe shines in the city of lights, Benzema's racking up the hat tricks, and the Reds want Mo Magic in Liverpool. This ain't amateur hour. This is the best of the best of the best. This is the UEFA Champions League. Stream every match live on Paramount Plus. Oh, welcome back to Kegel Lazzo. You enjoy alongside Nigel Rio Coker, James Benj, and Michael LaHood. Uh, we just couldn't wait to get into the England Italy game. Um, obviously, Italy winning by a goal to nil. I was excited to speak to my Englishmen alongside us today, Nigel Rio Coker and James Benj. I'm pretty much not thrilled by the result, but certainly a lot to build upon for England as they go forward. But let's take a look at some of the other results around the Nations League that happened today and yesterday. France with a 2-0 victory over Austria. And Kylian Mbappe and Olivier Giroud on the score sheet. Uh, James, real quickly, Olivier Giroud, the oldest goal scorer for France. Kylian Mbappe, pretty much a good performance from France. But what about Giroud, man? He is chasing this French record. Yeah, he's probably going to break it, isn't he? Mm. It's quite... I don't know. It's it kind of a bit like when Harry Kane inevitably breaks the... England record, and maybe this is a little bit of North London bias shining through here. But it's, you know, it's maybe just a reward for there having been loads of international matches and, you know, these players having hung around for ages because Olivier Giroud is nowhere, no one's idea of the greatest French striker anyway. But, you know, you should be rewarded for your consistency and your availability and for still doing it at an older age. And I know we spoke a few weeks back on the pod about my admiration for Giroud a player who mm. always works to bring the best out of others and uh, is yeah. going to be rewarded by the title of France's record scorer, presumably until Mbappe takes it off him eventually. Mike, before I rattle through the other games that took place in the Nations yeah. League, I know you're a bit of a fanboy, Olivier Giroud. Yeah, I have a poster of him. In... No, just kidding. Um, I love the <laughs> fact that he's back in the fold. It's going to come down between him and Benzema, who is the leading striker for this team. And if you're the French national team coaching staff, you have to see who gets the best out of Griezmann and Kylian Mbappe, because that's how you won a World Cup. Although it didn't show up on the goal scoring stats, it did show up in the style of play and the control and the impact you get out of your attacking core. And Giroud making a, a very good statement for himself saying, hey, don't count me out. Helping Milan win Serie A scored massive goals against Inter, picking up where he left off scored again against Inter, and there's something about that blonde hair of his that just, it just makes you, it just draws you in to the fact that, hey, this guy is just taking it to another level. When I look at France, though, injuries. Jules Koundé, that's a big loss, given his form for Barcelona, and, you know, the, the France are going to this back three, but the French national team, they're spoiled for riches right now. A golden generation and a young generation. That U21 team that were they were on the under 21 team in the last World Cup. A lot of those players coming up. Do you now give some of those players a chance, given that the World Cup is coming in a, in a couple of months' time and some of these players are are knocking at the door to break in to the first team? 
Well, France with a 2-0 victory thanks to Mbappe's 28th French goal and for Giroud it was his 49th for France. Croatia had a 2-1 victory over Denmark, Borna Sosa on the score sheet, as was Lovro Meyer, his third national team goal. Orsic with the assist right there. James Benz, you'll be pleased to know he's been a superstar player for you. He's your guy. Uh, Belgium with a victory over Wales. Interesting result, obviously, in the US and England group. Wales struggling to get victories right now. Kevin De Bruyne on the score sheet, as was Michi Batshuayi. He has uh, had back to back games with the national team with a goal right now. Kiefer Moore in good goal scoring form. Six goals for him under Rob Page since he's taken over. As boss of Wales also signed a new contract recently, but they need to start winning games, Wales. Otherwise, they're in trouble in the World Cup. And then Poland lost to the Netherlands. Cody Gakpo, the PSV winger, is having an absolute terrific season. Ten goals already this campaign for PSV. That's two and two for him. Uh, eight goals in his last seven games for club and country, assisted by Dumfries on the opening goal. And then Steven Bergwijn with his seventh national team goal to make it 2 0. It's amazing to me to see Louis van Gaal celebrating. You've got Edgar David, you've got all the crazy old school historic players on the bench for the Netherlands. Uh, it's amazing to me how, how crazy they could be as a team and how dangerous they'll be. Let's jump on to what happened today. Brazil and Ghana in an international friendly game. You guys were absolutely terrific yesterday, breaking down South American sides, including Brazil. Um, Mike, I know you were really watching Brazil today closely. Yeah. Uh, we did see them get the 3-0 victory over Ghana. Marquinhos on the score sheet, as was Richarlison a couple of times. Uh, Neymar, a good performance from him. But overall, Ghana had absolutely no chance. And Brazil are in such terrific form right now. They could be favorites to win the whole thing at the World Cup. This was a game that it was a disappointing performance for Ghana, given how some of their players are playing in some of the biggest leagues in Europe. Mohamed Kudus, I thought he was going to be more of a factor. And I think the fact that he's been playing as a false nine for Ajax and now asked to play an attacking midfield role, his natural position, and Yaki Williams making his debut, I would have liked to see him start. They yep. chose to bring him off the bench when the game was pretty much done, but this game was all about Brazil. Interesting tidbit on the lineup. I think this was one of the most attacking lineups that TJ could have put out. Casemiro, Neymar playing in the midfield, and Lucas Paqueta on either side of Casemiro. Could that be a way that they try and break down teams that sit in a low block at the World Cup? And I love that from TJ, putting out one of his strongest lineups he can, putting out one of his strongest attacking lineups that he can, players in form. But this was all about Neymar and Richarlison. Neymar being the facilitator in this game, knowing that it's not just about him bringing his teammates in, Richarlison, what he's doing for Spurs, he's now taking to the Brazilian national team. Their telepathy and link up with the Olympics, we're seeing it now go to the full team. And this Brazil team keeps looking stronger and stronger. I love the fact that Marquinhos and Thiago Silva, Thiago Silva came off early, a little bit of an injury worry. Hopefully that that isn't a blow for Brazil at the World Cup. And Chelsea fans will be looking at that one to see how he recovers for the Premier League season. But this Brazil team is looking complete. And when they in the second half, 60th minute, game's done and dusted. They bring on Fabinho for Casemiro. First time I've seen Casemiro captain the national team in a while. And then they bring in Anthony on one flank. And who's the other player? Ah, doesn't even matter. Star players coming in. It just shows the depth Rodrigo. of this team. Rodrigo, yeah. It just shows the depth of this team where Vinicius Jr., another player who's playing lights out for Real Madrid, this Brazil team looks more and more complete with each game. But at the end of the day, they could go to the World Cup and get surprised by everyone. But I, I think they're clear favorites for this World Cup. Do I really have to talk about Brazil? Honestly, yes. and do I really have to talk about Brazil? Like, Yeah, you're, you're a South American I'm just gonna expert. Make, I'm just going to make fun of it anyway. I'm just going to say, look, Casemiro joins the Red Devils and he becomes the captain of Brazil, eh? How about that? He joins the Red Devils, eh? Captain in his country. <laughs> PR, Listen, PR, baby, PR. I don't want to talk about Brazil till the World Cup because Michael's really covered everything. It is frightening the amount of talent that they have just in this squad that they picked for these games. Let's mm -hmm. not forget the players that they've left out, the players that are still fighting to get in this squad. It is frightening. All Brazil have to do is turn up with the right commitment, the right attitude, the right togetherness, the unity that we used to see of the Brazil of old. Remember that Brazil that came out for a World Cup and they're all holding hands together. First time people saw people do that. That kind of commitment and togetherness. If they do that, there's no reason why Brazil should not win this World Cup because the talent they have is phenomenal. I don't think I have personally seen as talented, as stacked up of a Brazil team as we are seeing now. We're used to seeing the Brazil of old where you might have one or two players and it was always the strikers. It was always whether it would be Ronaldo, Rivaldo, Ronaldinho, or Danielson, 
you know, one or two or Romario and Dunga. But now you're seeing talent throughout the whole team from centre backs who can play and score goals and be dangerous from yeah. full backs. And also the attacking options are just absolutely ridiculous. So I just don't think it's fair to talk about Brazil till we see them in the World Cup because it's... it's Nigel, a- I thought you didn't want to talk about Brazil. <laughs> oh, here we go. The floor is yours, James, mate. James, before you jump in here, let me just read off a couple of stats for you about Brazil. They've kept 12 clean sheets in their last 17 games, 13 wins, three draws, one loss. Um, and apparently, if your name's Gabriel and you play for Arsenal, you can't get <laughs> into the squad. So just real quickly, I want your opinion on yeah, Brazil before yeah, we move on. That's brilliant. Yeah, I mean, we spoke to Gabriel Jesus about that last week. He's just being rested. Like, huh. Chiche is using this. I mean, he will yeah, not be right. happy to see Richarlison <laughs> score too, but he is absolutely, he's in the... You know, barring injury, he's in the squad. But, I mean, probably has more of a, a fight for that number nine shirt than he might have liked now that Richarlison's playing so well. I mean, I, like kind of like Nigel says, it's hard to have many thoughts on Brazil because they're just such a gaudy collection of attacking players. I guess the thing I'm going to look at in that tournament is how they fare at fullback. Because yeah. Alex yeah. Tellez on one side and, and Ed Militao, who I think should be okay. Like, he's a centre-back with fullbackish skills. But... You know, usually you can kind of write that list of the teams that win World Cups for whatever reason are the teams with the best fullbacks in the tournament. Mm, um, good point. So that would be the, except yeah. except France, obviously. Um, but um, Pavard, that, Pavard's world class. It's not even not even France class. Um, <laughs> that would be the only. I mean, like you're literally looking for like tiny things that could go wrong, and sometimes things do go wrong for Brazil. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, you know it's. Just could be just bad luck. Could be good. Maybe, luck, maybe it helps that the fact that the World Cup is where it's being played, um, and it's also in the winter. Um, mm. it, it, very difficult to get your hands on alcohol. Very difficult to go to a nightclub. <laughs> there's not no, there's not many distractions going to be had by a lot of these players. Wow, and so Ian, that might be the that's situation. Not nice. Take it just not just nice. putting it out there. When it comes to big competition, out. sometimes you could have a big distraction, and you don't want these superstars to be distracted. I think they'll be fully focused on what they're doing at the World Cup, and I think you you're all right. I think Brazil are the team to beat right now with the way that they are performing all right let's move on uh just a reminder before we do move on though england lost today let's touch upon what happened <laughs> with the united states of america wow. they also lost today against a fantastic japan side who really just blew me away with how well organized they were how disciplined they were the football that they played it was very very pretty uh two goals one thanks to daichi kamara the 26 year old frankfurt attacker he scored a lovely goal that was obviously checked by video review apparently it wasn't there but then it was there. Uh, great finish from him. And then Mitoma scored in the 88th minute to wrap things up. Uh, his fifth national team goal, the Brighton and Hove Albion player. Now, uh, Michael LaHood, I know the, the, the WhatsApp group chat was, was firing oh. away in your direction because everybody couldn't wait. Let's talk about Team USA. In my opinion, before we get started, they were poor. The defense yeah. looked poor. They looked poor. a little bit tired. Poor they looked generous. tentative. Poor. They looked nervous. There was only one player that stood out for me today, and it mm-hmm. was the goalkeeper, which is tremendously good for the goalkeeper situation, yep. but for what the U.S. are doing <laughs> and wanting to achieve at this World Cup, that was a really awful performance overall. I, I, I want to be realistic, and uh, I, I purposely I went ham on Nigel and Benj because I know it's going to come back tenfold, so I'm just covering myself in Kevlar for what's coming. Benj is already, Nigel, both of them are already peppering me with stairs of daggers. So realistically, this was not acceptable. If you're a U.S. men's national team fan, you'd be very worried. I'm very worried because look at the unanswered questions with only a couple months ahead of the World Cup. You're still looking for your best center back pairings. That is not a good thing. You're still looking for your best goalkeeper. I think that question has been answered. And Matt Turner, he's your guy. If he doesn't start against, if he doesn't start in that first game of Qatar, massive problems for Greg Berhalter on his, and his staff and this team. You're still mm-hmm. looking for a number nine. And Jesus Ferreira, he might be a player that you put in in a different game where you have to break a team down. I don't think he is the clear number nine for this team. You have a player. You have so many missing pieces. I look at Germany. You have John Brooks. Why he has not been called back into this national team is just one of the biggest mysteries. Maybe off the field issues we know that's happened with this group during this World Cup cycle. That might be a factor. But when you look up top, you have a player that plays for Union Berlin. And Jordan, is it PFOC? Is it Supertich? Just, changes call, just call him Jordan. Jordan. Jordan, whatever. He is. This guy has a couple goals to his name, a couple assists to his name for the Bundesliga, Bundesliga leaders. How do you not call a guy like that? 
yes, Christian Pulisic is out, and I know you, the English lads have a couple things to say about that, but there's still a lot of question marks that should not be coming into the fold this close to the World Cup, and they were thoroughly outplayed. I thought they couldn't handle the press. Aaron Long and Walker Zimmerman, they crapped themselves. I don't know how to say this. I know it's a family show. They crapped themselves. There's other words to describe that. They absolutely crapped themselves. A lot of the chances Japan had, credit to them, came from the press, and the midfield was overrun. And even in the midfield, last thing I'll say about that, you don't even know where Brendan Aronson is going to play. Is he going to play as an attacking mid? Is he going to play as a winger? That question should be answered. I would play him in the middle of the park because he's proving in the Premier League that he can get it done there. With, mm-hmm. with, already, with runs out of midfield, his tenacity on the press, on the counter. I think that's where they're going to get the most out of him. But Greg Berhalter, he is definitely going to have to do some rethinking ahead of the next match against Saudi Arabia. I, James, I'm going to enjoy this. That <laughs> This was an, a truly atrocious display of football. Um, and I mean, you know, I know England set a, a bar quite low. I mean, if we're reversing the time flow here, you know, talking about what we were discussing earlier, England was a low bar, but the US, they didn't just squeeze under it. This wasn't Harrison Ford sliding through in Indiana Jones. They could have walked, they could have jumped under it. It was really poor across the pitch. It starts at the back. And, that, you know, Greg Berhalter had complaints about the pitch, and rightly so. Like, it was bad, but not so bad that Japan couldn't play some really nice football on that on that same surface when they when they won the ball back. Um, this is a team that, and I, I kind of was listening to, uh, to Heath and Jimmy on, on it in Soccer We Trust, and they're kind of talking about how it kind of became clear with that pairing at the back of Zimmerman and Long that there wouldn't really be any pretenses of, of being able to play nice football, build play from the back. You know, these two didn't look like they could progress the ball into midfield if there were no Japanese players on the pitch. Um, it, it was... Sunday you know, it's, it's hard. How do you make a judgment call on, on Jesus Ferreira when the ball never gets that far? That's a real worry. And to do that and then not be, you know, they're so weak under the press. I know this is not, you know, this was an aberration for Germany, for, for the USA. They've been better. I do understand that. But this was so... That's debatable. This was such a... This was such mm, a depth that yeah. they that they plumbed. It would really worry me, and I think you. I don't understand what Berhalter wants to do because he's put out a squad that looks like it should be sit, sit back, keep it tight, try and nick a, a goal at the other end. But they don't look like they can defend. They don't look like they can counter attack. They don't look like they can build possession play. All on the basis of this game, it's you know. <laughs> <laughs> they'll do well to get out of the group if they play anywhere near this level. In fact, they'll do well to get any points if they play anywhere near this level. Go ahead, Nigel. James. <clears throat> Mike, let me clear my throat. <clears throat> oh, man, here we go. Mike. Mike. <laughs> yes. Do you know what? Ian, I'm disappointed in you, first and foremost, to say you're actually surprised at Japan and how well they played in the style of football because Japan are a well-conditioned nation when it comes to football. Always qualified generally for the World Cups. Great footballing team who produce some fantastic tactical, uh, technical players. They very, they press very high, very high energy. Let's not forget, you're an Italian fan as well. They produced Nikata for us. The legendary Nikata who was at Bologna and, and uh, Florentina. What a player he was. Parma as well. Anyway, let me get to the USA. Mm. Mike, where do I start? Where <laughs> do I start? Like, it's literally, for me, it's absolutely embarrassing. Because for me, Japan is the type of team you really want to test to see how far you've come along as a nation. Because those are the type of games, more than likely, nine out of ten times, you will be facing in a World Cup. Forget all these pre-games beforehand or anything like that. Those are the games that you will be playing when the World Cup starts. And if USA crumble just like that, I don't want to hear no USA fanboy saying about we've got the talent, the golden generation, because you are miles off it. The modern game that all these players play in and have experience in most teams do this high press. You have to be comfortable with the ball under pressure. USA clearly are not. And for me, they're not creating. Defensively is the biggest problem. If they don't set out, sort out their centre-back pairing, they looked all over the place, completely all over the place. It could have finished four or five today. And your, best, your goalkeeper being the best player isn't a bit of a surprise to me because that's one thing I will give America credit for. They do produce some fantastic top-class goalkeepers. Can we move on from producing top-class goalkeepers to producing top-class players along the pitch to different aspects of the game? Because that's what's truly needed. You can't rely on your goalkeeper consistently. Need to score goals. 
my biggest thing is how is America going to be do so well with the golden boy Christian Pulisic not even playing at Chelsea gets in the American squad and gets injured to not play that is worrying that is completely worrying Dest doesn't play at AC Milan comes on gives away a penalty and plays in the US national team and didn't really have a great game again today Mike this golden generation that I've heard America's gone so much about I think that America and the press need to slow down the fanboy thing and realize as much as you guys are producing some good players, other nations ain't sitting there. Who, who's saying players. that they played well though, Nigel? No one's saying they played well. No one's saying this. Who's saying I'm this is a golden generation? Who's oh, saying wait, it though? Uh, a lot <laughs> of Americans are saying that this is a golden yeah. generation. Hey, yeah. Ian, Ian, you might not be saying it because you know your football. But a lot of other people, <laughs> Americans, are saying that this is the golden generation. I've heard it too many times. I've heard people even say America's squad can compare against and compete against England's squad. No. Nowhere near it when it comes to football inability. For me, you should be very, very worried, regardless yeah. of what squad he picked. And I'll tell you what is the most worrying thing for me. The fact that the manager at the end of the game huh. pretty much looked so confused and lost in what he just witnessed and was nearly in tears, asking his players to show a bit more personality and character. That is worrying. Your manager should not go and say that for me in public or in the press. You can't say that you want more personality and character because at the end of the day, that's not going to sit well in that dressing room. That's down for the manager to bring out that personality and that character within them players and let them go out there and express themselves. That is the worrying thing for me. And I've always said it, that most of the young athletes that come out in America, their personality and their character, they're always playing the NBA or NFL. I very rarely see it in the MLS or in the soccer field. But if you're an American fan, Mike, which I know you are, you should be very worried at that performance. Go ahead, James. Jump in. I, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, we're not quite done. I, I, it's probably a bit of a wound <laughs> for you now, Mike. But I've just got some some salt here and I'm going to salt by it on. Um, I think the thing that would worry me the absolute most about this, you know, I think certainly I, I kind of felt like on the commentary there was a little bit of a stereotype and we all could probably indulge with this in, in how what we think of Japan. And we don't think of them as a team that can bully their opposition. Mm. But guess oh. what? This US team, and we think of the US, and I think we think of players like Zimmerman, and we think of players, um, you know, even like Tyler Adams, as players that shouldn't lose 50-50 duels. Across the pitch, mm. these players were bouncing off their Japanese opponents. Yeah. And I think that's particularly relevant because, you know, what I, I, don't, I can't say I know too much about Iran, but I can guarantee you Rob Page will have watched that. And he'll be talking to Gareth Bale, and he'll be talking to you know, the, the Ben Davises and players that can assert themselves physically on any mm. opponent. And he'll be saying, what Japan just did, we can do that too. And England mm. will think the same. And I'm sure I'm sure Iran, who have just beaten Uruguay and clearly are no mugs, will be thinking the same. That, for me, is the real worry because I never looked at this US team and thought it would be lo losing most of the jewels it was it was fighting in. And, and if that's happening, as well as all the structural things we were just talking about, and I'm sure Nigel has... More structural things to point out because there was a lot. <laughs> well, do you know what? I'm not even going to go on too much about it. I'm just going to say this from Mike's perspective, because obviously he is Mr. USA. Are you worried? No, no, Mike, seriously, though. Yeah, are yeah. you not really worried about the lack of, forget the manager saying, the lack of character that you saw, the lack of leadership, the lack of personality that you saw from that USA team today <laughs> against Japan? Uh, are you not worried? I'm, I'm very much worried. I, I think that... This is a culmination of getting away with things during CONCACAF qualifying um, that winning, as we all know, winning covers up so many cracks and the teams that are winning and doing it the right way and doing it in the style, the cracks are minimal for this U.S. team. You go and play certain teams in weather you should never be allowed to play in um, to get a result and you purposely do the game there and do the dark. It's the dark arts of CONCACAF qualifying. So you do what you have to do to qualify. Teams do it all around the world. But that is what you hang your hats on. Um, you, you just, they've, I think they've gotten away with a lot of things, a, a player who I think could be the X factor to rectify that is the likes of a Gio Reyna. Can he stay healthy? And I'm looking for a response. I will know a lot more. I think Greg Berhalter, the look that you saw on his face was the realization of a manager of, Oh crap. My team may not be as good as I thought they were. We may have to go back into being pragmatic and maybe scrape for a one nil or nil nil and, and do the mathematical mathematical equation to try and sneak out of our group. Um, I think him and his staff will be scratching their heads looking for a response. I know I am looking for a response. It's almost like a must win sort of response to have continued faith in this team.
because there are a lot of players who are not in a good way right now. You look at Weston McKinney. I didn't even notice he was on the field. I, I noticed him because of his haircut. That was about it. Didn't see any wizardry. I think you're all pretty too nice and pretty much too nice because I know that producer Des is trying to get us out of here without allowing me to have my say on uh, even my <laughs> nation. And even though I sound like this, I was still born in California. I still have a U.S. passport and I still have a say as to what happens around the U.S. national team, having also represented them at youth level. Let me tell you, that was freaking embarrassing. Nowhere near good enough. Nowhere good enough tactically. Nowhere good enough with the spirit. Nowhere good enough with the passion. Nowhere good enough as far as energy. The players look tired. I mean, Weston McKinney looked very poor in this game. You look for your leaders, Tyler Adams. The players are disagreeing with each other. McKinney, after a poor pass, looking over to Adams, blaming each other for poor passes. I take nothing away from what Japan did in that game. It was fantastic. They were good footballing-wise. They had a clear plan, a clear idea, and they played some good football, and they probably should have scored more goals thanks to Matt Turner. It wasn't more goals in that game. However, it was a complete disgrace what we witnessed. Um, I will say this, though. When I looked at the, the images coming out of Dusseldorf, it took me back to my days playing in Germany because the last time I played at that stadium, I got a red card, and I can guarantee you if I was playing for Team USA in that game, I would have got another freaking red card because there was no passion there. There was no nothing there from this team. If you want more in-depth analysis about Team USA and what they're doing around the World Cup, please go ahead and uh, check out In Soccer We Trust. I tuned in. James Ben tuned in. And it was sensational today. Jimmy Conrad, Heath Pierce, <laughs> Chuck Davies. It was absolutely brilliant. So if you want to see that passion from those guys, they got in-depth about everything that's wrong with the national team, including yeah. Greg Perhalter. Maybe they'd even invite James Benj and Nigel Rio Coker on there to get after <laughs> this team as well after today. Um, but let me just rattle through a few other results before we get out of here. Qatar and Canada. Canada got the 2-0 victory. Kyle Lahren, Jonathan David on the score sheet for them. Big victory for Canada as they get set to take their place in the World Cup. Korea Republic again, Costa Rica 2-2. That one finished there. Mm. Song uh, Song Hun Min was on the score sheet as well cracking goal to make it 2-2 at the end of the game um, and that's about it for us guys I uh, just thought I'd throw a bit of passion before we get the hell out of here um, but great job to all of you Nigel Rio Coker thank you very much for your passion your calmness when talking about England and uh, sometimes your hatred towards the US men's national team <laughs> hold on, hold on I don't hate the US national team let's be right <laughs> I just like to give people a bit of a reality check okay football is the world's game they can't come in and start thinking they're going to make it the <laughs> NFL, NBA, or no, 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 the football belongs to us. So they need to sometimes be sit down, listen, and learn. Okay, learn to crawl before you can start walking. I'll ask you that again on November 25th when England do take on uh, the US. Mm. Uh, James Bench, terrific as always. You got a nice weekend planned. I hope you enjoy yourself. Thank you so much for joining us and your excellence every time you put it out there on cbssports.com. Make sure you go check him mm. out. And Michael Hood, uh, just awesome stuff, man. Thanks for covering across uh, the South American team today. You covered Brazil incredibly well and Team USA. I know you took a bit of a hitting today, but you deserved it and so did the US <laughs> men's national team. And thanks to everybody out there for tuning in for us today on Keiko Lazo. Please make sure you take a minute to leave us a rating uh, and a review on your favorite podcast platform. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere else you listen to your podcast. We're also available as video. Sorry, Nigel. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Make sure you go to YouTube to check out us every single week. We have four or five episodes coming your way. Make sure you join in the conversation. We've got big plans for the show. We create the show for you. We bring the best personalities in here. As you can tell, I'm absolutely knackered. I'm a little bit pissed off with the US men's national team performance. Nigel's a bit angry about England's performance. James is going to grab his fifth glass of wine. We'll see you <laughs> next time, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. <laughs>